Welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship, a virtual gathering of believers seeking to better understand the Word of God, with your hosts, Derek and Sharon Gilbert, and Sam T. Doxon. From the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, greetings and welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship Old Testament Bible Study for Sunday, February 16th, 2020. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and welcome to our humble bunker. By the way, in case you haven't heard... We lost Sam T. Doxon. He went to be with the Lord on February the 11th, last Tuesday morning, around 7 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, Went into a coma around 6.30, and I'd been up with him all night. If you haven't heard the story, we tell it on Cy Friday. But honestly, it was as wonderful a passing as I can ever imagine. So this is our first Bible study without Sam, you know, sort of helping us through. So... (laughs) It may be a little... Also, it means that I won't have to stop halfway and go, that's I've right. got to let him out because yeah, he's right. staring at me. So if you've gotten kind of accustomed to that, uh, sadly, you won't be hearing those little interruptions. You won't hear the tap, tap, tap across the floor as uh, Sam comes in and goes out. And uh, uh, that uh, that will be in the archives forever. And uh, I'm sure we, at times, will go back and listen for those. Mm-hmm. Uh, just as you know, when you go back far enough in the PID radio archives, you can hear Bell and Gretel and Murphy barking in the background mm-hmm. at various things. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, um, back in the day when we had, they each had their own photograph with a tinfoil helmet on. Yeah, and of course Sam had his own helmet that our friend from Michigan, Matt Skripchak, made for him. Yes, with a, a spark plug on it and a little light that kind of flashed off and on, which he said was the alien thought stealer disruptor helmet. <laughs> and it worked. It worked. Sam's thoughts were never ever stolen by aliens or demons or anything. So, no, no. Uh, but of course, being a dachshund, that was never really a danger. No, no, no not that was not, not a chance. But anyway, we we do so. miss him. And yes, we will keep Sam in our logo because mm-hmm. he helped to establish Gilbert House. He really and, did. Uh, he's a big part of our family still. We know that we believe pets go to heaven and we will see him again. Ecclesiastes 319. Solomon wrote that uh, man and the animals are created with, the, the English Bible says one breath, but the uh, Hebrew is ruach behind the word breath. And that's the word translated spirit in many other verses in the Old Testament. So, uh, uh, and as our our friend, local police chief points out, you know, when Jesus comes back, he's riding a horse. So that means horses are in heaven, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if horses, why not? Dogs and guinea pigs and birds and bunnies and probably not cats. I'm not sure about cats. I don't know. You cat lovers out there, you're probably disagreeing with us. We're just teasing. uh, No, we are teasing. teasing. There are so, some really loving cats out there. Yeah, and horses and mm-hmm. cattle and sheep. And, you know, the, in, the, in the, the, the restored earth, the way God originally designed it, we see in Isaiah, the wolf flies down with the lamb. Mm-hmm. It, it is wolf and lamb, by the way. It is wolf and lamb, yes, the, it we're, is. we're not using the Mandela translation. Uh, <laughs> but and, and he's joking yes, when he says that. I'm teasing, it's of course. many of us because we've seen a number of ministries for decades that use lion, lion and lamb. And lamb. Right. Um, no, it's wolf and lamb. Yeah, the, the verse actually says that. But the, the lion is mentioned in the next par- in the next yeah, uh, exactly, verse. which is how you conflate them together. So, and a little child will lead them. Yes. And, uh, so we're looking forward to that day. Uh, of course, we're seeing the dachshund will probably be out ahead of the little child, <laughs> running with his ears flapping, <laughs> flapping in the breeze, flapping in the wind. So, so well, awesome. Well, we may fin May May. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, there's a lot of there there yeah, in the book of Job. We got through one whole chapter last week, yeah, so. Mm. Yeah, there, there may be some, but speaking of animals, we get to a couple of animals here in Job, the next couple of chapters of Job, that are really fascinating and that uh, Bible scholars have struggled with and wrestled with for a long time. So we'll go into a little bit of the, uh, explan- some of the explanations, the naturalistic mm-hmm. explanation, and then the, uh, uh, what we think is a, a more accurate explanation of what's going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, because this, boy, this is some really cool stuff. I These know. are the chapters that uh, you get, that kids get excited about when you start reading this, and we'll we'll show you as we dive into this. So, Father, we thank you for bringing us together over your word, and and we thank you again, Lord, for blessing us for a time with the animals that you created to be parts of our lives: dogs and cats, birds and bunnies, guinea pigs, hamsters, lambs, goats, horses, cattle. Father, you created them all. And you placed them here on this earth and then charged us with taking dominion over them, which doesn't mean to dominate them and treat them cruelly, but to care for them in the way you have cared for all of your creation. So, Lord, help us this day, if you've placed animals in our charge, to treat them as you want us to treat them. We know from your word that not a sparrow falls from the air, that you don't know it. 
And so how much more valuable are we and the trust that you have placed in us to care for your creation? Lord, help us to be good stewards of this world until you come to reclaim it and restore it to your original glorious design. And until that day, Father, we pray for wisdom to help us better understand your word so that we would know what you would have us do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Boy, that started getting to me there. <laughs> Imagine that. I love your, your gentle heart. Uh, well, speaking of animals, God using his knowledge of the animal kingdom, mm -hmm. because, you know, he created them. He drew up the specs uh, to instruct Job. Job yeah. chapter 39. To school Job. Yes. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the does? Can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you know the time when they give birth, when they crouch, bring forth their offspring, and are delivered of their young? Their young ones become strong. They grow up in the open. They go out and do not return to them. Who has let the wild donkey go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift donkey, to whom I have given the arid plain for his home and the salt land for his dwelling place? He scorns the tumult of the city. He hears not the shouts of the driver. This says, here's not the chiding of the tax gatherer. I'm looking at the Brenton uh, Septuagint as you read the, the ESV. Mm. Tax to, gatherer. Yeah. And the donkey was a key animal in the world of Job. And in the world of, uh, of the Even, ancient realm, it was a sacred animal that was often right. sacrificed. That is correct, because the donkey made it possible to travel across the arid places. Yes. Even before camels were tamed and used for caravan training, the donkeys were used in the, across the Syrian desert. Camels came out of Arabia, of course. So this was, this was an animal that was very, very important in the ancient world. And in fact, we know from a text found from about the time of Abraham, from one of the kingdoms, the ancient Amorite kingdoms located in what is now Syria, that a king was chided by one of his ministers. My Lord should honor his kingship by riding a donkey. Don't ride horses. Horses are for soldiers. Kings ride donkeys. And that's why Jesus rode a donkey into exactly, Jerusalem. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, also, I think the Lord here is saying every thing I've created has a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Verse five again. Who has let the wild donkey go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift donkey to whom I have given the arid plain for his home and the salt land for his dwelling place? He scorns the tumult of the city. He hears not the shouts of the driver. He ranges the mountains as his pasture and he searches after every green thing. Is the wild ox willing to serve you? Septuagint says unicorn. Yeah, that's an interesting, uh, this is one of those words that's difficult to translate. Exactly. Since we're not in the context of the mind of Job, yeah. um, we don't exactly know what this old, old, is. this, this is old Hebrew. Mm -hmm. That a lot of times the words in here have no other, they're not used ever again. Right. And that's, that's always helpful if you can see them in a sentence, see how they're used, mm -hmm. then you can better guess at what they actually mean. And some of the words that we run across in, in Job are borrowed terms. Right, from uh, other languages, mm -hmm. which is something that a lot of scholars don't look at. But we need to understand that Moses was very familiar with Egyptian. There was a lot of cross-pollination between mm -hmm. the culture of Egypt and ancient uh, Yes, uh, now Canaan. you're not saying Moses wrote Job. No, no, no. But, uh, but I'm just using, for example, we also see Egyptian loan words in Isaiah. Mm -hmm. uh, we see Aramaic loan words. All the time. I just wanted to clarify so people yes, didn't right. go, oh, he's yeah, saying it. Yeah. Um, now, we no, we don't know Job, who wrote Job. Right, right. But the uh, language suggests that it's much older mm -hmm. than the Genesis account, which is why we skipped from the story of Nimrod to Job before we get back to Abraham. Well, again, yeah. we, yeah, we, we, these are in the order in which they occurred mm -hmm. as and, best we can figure out. Right. And if you're trying to figure out the look ahead at the way the schedule is, we do have a, a like a calendar, a schedule of the verses in the order that we try to read them. And of course we never get as many chapters done in a week as we think we're going to, no. but you at least get an idea, especially when we start getting into uh, the Psalms, when we're skipping back and forth between Kings, Chronicles, and Psalms. Uh, because it makes those Psalms come to life right. when you see what David is going through at the time that he wrote them. Mm -hmm. 
Now, here, here's one thing, and I wrote about the, the wild ox, back to the wild ox of verse 9 here. I wrote about it in uh, Last Clash of the Titans. There's a chapter in there where I write a lot about uh, bull imagery in ancient Mesopotamia because Mm -hmm. you see it a lot in their depictions of their gods and their divine creatures like the bull man, which was a kusuriku, the Mesopotamian, Akkadian word, Mm -hmm. which is sort of like a demonic creature with a bull's head. But then there were also the the karavim or the, uh, uh, the not the apkalo, the uh, lamasu of the Akkadians, which were Big, uh, scary dudes. They, they were had the body of a bull, the feet of a lion, wings of an eagle, and then a human head. Well, again, those are the four creatures dis, d- that are described as it being part of the caravim. Mm-hmm. The four faces of the caravim are the four creatures in these lamasu. Yeah. So they were not, the, the, the cherubim, caravim is the correct pronunciation, in the Bible were not, uh, they were known to the other cultures in ancient Mesopotamia. The Bible was not created in a vacuum apart from the cultures around it. It's just the Bible is the accurate account. Yes, exactly. So, the rest is fake news. Right. Um, so the this, wild ox was it was a type of cattle called the aurochs, A-U-R-O-C-H-S. And I think the next verse will help to clarify this. Yeah. Uh, is the wild ox willing to serve you? Will he spend the night at your manger? Can you bind him in the furrow with ropes or will he harrow the valleys after you? Will you depend on him because his strength is great? And will you leave to him your labor? In other words, can you tame him to, you know, plow your field for you and the answer to that question is no No. the the aurochs went extinct in the 16th century the last one was killed in poland in the 1500s except they're rebreeding them now yeah yeah and these things are huge the male the the bulls stand about six foot at the shoulder what could possibly go wrong yeah uh death when it's six foot at the shoulder that means the head is a whole lot higher than a six foot man there are woodcuts from germany in the 15th century showing how you're supposed to hunt these things. I mean, you get a lot of beef off these things, but mm-hmm. you got... With the, dachshunds. <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's the plan. You get the aurochs to chase you. I'll hide behind this really big tree. And actually, that's what the woodcut showed. You, yeah. you get the bull to chase you. You hide behind a tree and it, it rams its head into the tree. Then you jump out from behind the tree and spear and it. laugh. <laughs> yeah. Ha <laughs> uh-huh. ha. Yeah. Hold you again. So... Uh, it's not, and the other interesting thing, and I almost forgot about this part, the Akkadian word for the aurochs is ditanu, uh. which is the root word behind the name of the ancient Amorite tribe, the Tadanu, which in turn was where the Greeks got their name of their old gods, the Titans. Yeah, I would say that that definitely associates in the minds of the uh, the original culture that came right. up with that language, that perhaps the Titans were able to ta- to tame the aurochs? Yeah. Or the other explanation is, here, it, it, would it be possible for you to tame these wild bull-like divine creatures? Yes, that's the other one. And that's the big takeaway here. Right. The, the descriptions may be of everything that God created, and we can't always see stuff that's in the other realm. Exactly. So, is the wild ox willing to serve It you? assumes that Job... Had a frame of reference. Sure. People back in that day uh, would have understood what, what yeah. was being written. Abraham about. wasn't surprised when God came to talk to him. Mm-hmm. Nor was so he surprised when... So one can when... assume that, you know, the small G gods were talking to folks all the time. Sure. Is the wild ox willing to serve you? Will he spend the night at your manger? Can you bind him in the furrow with ropes or will he harrow the valleys after you? Will you depend on him because his strength is great? And will you leave to him your labor? Do you have faith in him that he will return your grain and gather it to your threshing floor? What, wait a minute. And wilt thou believe that he will return to thee thy seed and bring it to thy threshing floor? You got to trust him to, uh, you know, do your farm work for you. Hmm. And Interesting. It, well, and, and, the and, and threshing bring floor. it to the threshing floor again. That threshing floor, that's way more than a place to, you know, bang out seeds. Right. Yeah. That was the portal between... This mm-hmm. realm and the spirit realm. And representative of an assembly. Yes. A throne in the other realm. The Canaanite creator god El, uh, when the Rephaim were summoned, they were summoned to the threshing floor of El, whose epithet was Bull El. Yes. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. More, more there there. Verse 13. The wings of the ostrich wave proudly, but are they the pinions and plumage of love? This says the peacock has a beautiful wing. Huh. If the stork and the ostrich conceive, it is worthy of notice. Hmm. Again, difficult to translate. 
for she leaves her eggs to the earth and lets them be warmed on the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them and that the wild beast may trample them. She deals cruelly with her young, as if they were not hers. Though her labor be in vain, yet she has no fear, because God has made her forget wisdom and given her no share in understanding. When she rouses herself to flee, she laughs at the horse and his rider. Again, that verse 18 there, rouses herself to flee. The English translators having to try to guess because mm-hmm. it's really archaic Hebrew that it, there's no frame of reference, no context. This says, in her season, she will lift herself on high. She will scorn the horse and the rider. Yeah. Verse 19, do you give the horse his might? Do you clothe his neck with a mane? Do you make him leap like the locust? His majestic snorting is terrifying. He paws in the valley and exults in his strength or the alternate translation, they paw in the valley. He goes out to meet the weapons. Again, the horse was the ride for soldiers, not for kings. Mm -hmm. He laughs at fear and is not dismayed. He does not turn back from the sword. Upon him rattle the quiver, the threshing or the flashing spear and the javelin. With fierceness and rage, he swallows the ground. He cannot stand still at the sound of the trumpet. When the trumpet sounds, he says, aha, he smells the battle from afar, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. Is it by your understanding that the hawk soars and spreads his wings toward the south? Is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and makes his nest on high? On the rock he dwells and makes his home, on the rocky crag and stronghold. From there he spies out the prey. His eyes behold it from far away. His young ones suck up blood. And where the slain are, there is he. (gasps) Interesting. Jesus echoes this phrase. Mm -hmm. Where... Uh, with the so the, where, where the uh, where the body is, the, so there the, the vultures yeah. or the hawks or the eagles gather. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Huh. So we're going to make it to the next one. Yes. Oh, Job chapter forty. And Yahweh said to Job, "Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it." Then Job answered Yahweh and said, "Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you?" I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. Then Yahweh answered Job out of the whirlwind. Remember, that's how he started Mm -hmm. talking. And said, dress for action like a man. Put on your big boy pants. (laughs) I will question you, and you make it known to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me, that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God, and can you thunder with a voice like his? Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the outflowings of your anger, and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Interesting. Verse 6 in the Septuagint says, and send forth angels in anger. Yes, I know. I was reading the Septuagint this morning. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The angel in the whirlwind. Um, Verse 10 again. Adorn yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on everyone who is proud and abase him. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low and tread down the wicked where they stand. This might be a reference to pride goeth before a fall, Mm -hmm. judgment seat of Christ, judgment seat of Yahweh, um, that he does all these things and the description of him putting on glory and speaking like thunder. This is a this is a description of how he looks Mm -hmm. and and when he's angry, don't make him mad. You wouldn't like him when he's angry. No, but he's righteous <laughs> mm-hmm. in his anger. Mm-hmm. Verse 13, hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. This is judgment language. Mm-hmm. And God is saying, if you can do this, go ahead and do these things. Yeah. Show me. Then will I acknowledge, also acknowledge you, Sorry, then will I also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can save you. Mm -hmm. Bottom line is, it can't. Right. And as the play title goes, your arm's too short to box Box with with God. God. Right. (laughs) And here we go. Verse 15. Behold, Behemoth, 
which I made as I made you. He eats grass like an ox. Let's stop and look at that word. Behemoth is interesting, and this super, is the first yeah the first time we see this in in scripture here. Behemoth uh, scholars have argued about this for thousands of years. Mm-hmm. People, the scholars take the naturalistic view. We'll try to identify this as a hippopotamus or an elephant or a crocodile. Well, let me go ahead and read the description, right. and then we'll we'll continue with that picture of hippopotamus mm-hmm. as I'm reading this. Right. Behold, behemoth, which I made as I made you. He eats grass like an ox. Behold, his strength in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. He makes his tail stiff like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs like bars of iron. He is the first of the works of God. Underline Mm -hmm. that. Let him who made him bring near his sword, for the mountains yield food for him where all the wild beasts play. Shall I stop there or go on? Um, Well, why don't we go through and and, uh, read uh, through the end of the chapter and we can discuss. Okay. Under the lotus plant he lies in the shelter of the reeds and in the marsh. For his shade the lotus trees cover him, the willows of the brook surround him. Behold, if the river, if the river is turbulent, he is not frightened. He is confident, though Jordan rushes against his mouth. Can one take him by his eyes or pierce his nose with a snare? Hmm. The the Septuagint is interesting, and, and it would appear that the Septuagint translators didn't really understand what kind of creature they were talking about here either. Um, the Lexham English Septuagint, which is a more modern translation of the Septuagint, reads, Behold now indeed the beasts before you, mm-hmm. rather than behemoth. Yeah, this says wild beasts with thee. Right. That's in the Brenton. Mm-hmm. Behold now its strength is in its loins and its power is in the middle of its belly. It sets its tail like a cypress and its sinews have been entwined together. Well, tail like a cypress, that doesn't sound like the little yeah. Sorry, really yeah. curly tail of a hippo, which a is sort of like a, like a little pig tail. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't want to be behind it at the wrong moment. Oh, oh. Talk about it hitting the fan. Yes. Uh, its ribs are ribs of bronze. Its backbone is cast in iron. It sets its tail like a cypress. Th- th- and especially when you continue down. Uh, to verse 19. 19 in the Brenton is, this is the chief of the creation of the Lord, mm-hmm. made to be played with by his angels. Right. Yeah. The, the Lexham English Septuagint uh, numbers it differently, and then it jumps into. Uh, it's it's also got the ch- the chapter separation set uh, set mm-hmm. differently, so it's yeah. a little difficult to follow exactly verse for verse where where we're at here. But because uh, uh, yeah, it, it starts the description of Leviathan before it gets to chapter forty one, which is where the English translation starts. Chapter forty one begins with Leviathan. Yeah, it's a new thought. So. But it, it almost appears. Well, first of all, uh, you're not going to see an elephant lying in in the water, you know, beneath the lotus and, and all of that. No, and it's also got a weenie tail. Yeah. So you're almost seeing a, a description of a sauropod, like a diplodocus or... or um, well, that's the best that we with our materialistic, right. you know, uh, thoughts can come up with. But the, he says, this was the first of my creation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, it, again, trying to find a naturalistic explanation, those are the, th- the closest things we can come up with to it. And I know there's some scholars who will point to behemoth as evidence of dinosaurs in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And I suppose you could make that interpretation. Uh, you know, tails stiff like a cedar. When you look at the way sauropods, the, the skeletons that have been found as sauropods, their tails mm-hmm. are long and huge, used for balance on those really huge creatures. And it's believed that many of them, or some of the species anyway, were a semi-aquatic, you know, spent their time in water because it gave buoyancy to these really huge bodies. But okay. it's not the most fearsome no, creature ever made by true. God. That's true. And this that's, is the chief, the first of the works of God. Right. Let him who made him bring near his sword. And that's where we're seeing other... You, you could almost make a... a speculate that perhaps it, it sounds more like a water buffalo, but again, then you don't have that, that depiction of the tail like a cedar. Right. So We also don't have uh, hippopotami in the mountains. 
Yeah, for true. the mountains yield food, food for, for him, him while right. all the wild beasts play. Right now, the uh, the dictionary of deities and demons has an entry on Behemoth, which is intriguing because I do think we're talking about some sort of supernatural entity here, I some think sort so of creature, too. because or at least something that was material. In if I'm I'm a believer in an earlier creation, doesn't mean that there was an earlier man, mm-hmm. but I think that there was a previous creation where the Elohim perhaps were were in charge of Earth, right? And they failed, and, and we see some evidence of that in um, First Enoch. In fact, let me skip to First Enoch. This is beginning at uh, verse seven of chapter sixty in First Enoch. This is uh, the Hermeneia translation, which is a more modern English translation by a scholar, who's George W. E. Nicholsburg, who studied uh, the mm-hmm. Book of Enoch and other wor- related works. Um, on that day, two monsters were separated. The female monster. Can you back up? Yeah, let me back up a little context. bit. What is? And um, okay, this is Enoch in first person. And Michael said to me, "What have you seen that you are so disturbed? Until today, has the day of his mercy lasted?" And he, meaning God, has been merciful and long-suffering to those who dwell on earth. And when the day and the power and the punishment and the judgment come, which the Lord of spirits has prepared for those who do not worship the righteous judge, for those who deny the righteous judgment, and for those who take his name in vain, and that day has been prepared for the elect, a covenant for the sinners of visitation. That day has been prepared for the elect, a covenant for the sinners of visitation." And on that day, two monsters were separated. The female monster, whose name is Leviathan, to dwell in the depth of the sea above the fountains of the waters. It still, still doesn't give me a whole lot of context to on that day, unless it's the day of the Lord. That, yeah. But that makes no sense either. And secondly, okay, let, let me back up to verse 1 of chapter 60. In the year 500, this would be the year of, and actually I was mistaken, it's not Enoch speaking, this is actually Noah speaking here. In the year 500, presumably his 500th year, in the seventh month, on the 14th of the month, in the life of Noah, in that parable, I saw how a mighty quaking made the heaven of heavens quake, and the host of the Most High and the angels, thousands of thousands and ten thousand times ten thousand, were greatly disturbed. And the head of days was sitting on the throne of his glory, and the holy and righteous angels were standing around him. And great trembling took hold of me, and fear seized me, and my loins were crushed, and my kidneys were loosened. Oh, <laughs> well... Okay. And I fell on my face. Scared spitless. And Michael sent another angel from among the holy ones, and he raised me up. And when he raised me up, my spirit returned, for I had not been able to endure the appearance of that host and its turmoil and the quaking of the heavens. And Michael said to me, what have you seen that you are so disturbed? Until today has the day of his mercy lasted, and he has been merciful and long-suffering to those who dwell on the earth. And when the day and the power and the punishment and the judgment come, which the Lord of hosts has prepared for those who do not worship the righteous judge. And this is talking about the flood that's coming. Yeah. And for those who deny the righteous judgment and for those who take his name in vain. And that day has been prepared for the elect, a covenant for the sinners of visitation. And on that day, two monsters were separated. The female monster, whose name is Leviathan, to dwell in the depth of the sea above the fountains of the waters. But the name of the male is Behemoth, who occupies with his breast the trackless desert named Dundane, which uh, Nicholsburg adds in a footnote is similar to Dudael, mm-hmm. which was the desert where Azazel was bound. Mm-hmm. So, uh, east of the garden where the chosen and righteous dwell. So, east mm-hmm. of Eden. Where my great grandfather was taken up, the seventh from Adam, the first man whom the Lord of Spirits created. So, apparently, Enoch. The seventh from Adam was taken up from that desert due to El or Dundane. Somewhere east of the desert. Somewhere sea. east of, yeah, exactly. And I asked another angel to show me the might of these monsters, how they were separated in one day and were thrown the one into the depth of the sea and the other into the dry land of the desert. And he said to me, here, son of man, you wish to know what is hidden. And the angel of peace who was with me said, These two monsters, prepared according to the greatness of the Lord, will provide food for the chosen and righteous, so that the punishment of the Lord of Spirits rests upon them, in order that the punishment of the Lord of Spirits does not go forth in vain. Interesting that we see elsewhere in the Old Testament that God crushes the heads of of the monster, of the Leviathan. Well, yes, and, and uses, seven heads. Right, uses her carcass to provide food for those in the wilderness. Mm-hmm. This also parallels the um, 
the gruesome sacrificial feast in Ezekiel 39 and in Revelation oh, 19 yes. after yes. the final battle. Where all the birds of the air come in. Right. Right. Hmm. Because, as I argued in Last Clash of the Titans, Leviathan, the seven-headed dragon that emerges from the sea, is Antichrist, Gog of Magog. And then defeated at... But, of course, Gog then is thrown into prison for a thousand years, comes out again at the end of the thousand years. Mm-hmm. Still, argue, still, still wrestling with that I one know, in my mind. I'm still yeah. not convinced that Leviathan is actually Antichrist. I think that Leviathan provides, it, it's seven-headed, and, and mm-hmm. the eighth head is one of the seven. Right, right. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the beast itself is the Antichrist. But its spirit it enters some off. human, right. Mm-hmm. Antichrist in somehow. So, but uh, because I think the beast is probably the chaos dragon. Yeah, yeah. Still wrestling with that one. I know. If you're going to make it a cognate, cognate with Tiamat, whose head was crushed supposedly by, mm-hmm. you know, um, then then I think it's very difficult to say it is the Antichrist. But definitely um, Antichrist's mom, if you want to put it that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Now there's some. Uh, su- but, but are we saying that we know this for sure? No, because no. the language the Lord uses is intentionally obscure. He's hiding a lot of the details from the fallen realm. Right, right. Now, if we go to the New Revised Standard Version, there are a couple of passages in the Septu or the uh, Apocrypha that make reference to Leviathan and Behemoth. So mm-hmm. in Second Ezra six verse forty nine, we read. Then, and, and this is, by the way, during a description a, of the uh, seven-day creation. So let me, let me back up to verse 47. On the fifth, <clears throat> excuse me, on the fifth day, Second Edra 6, verse 47, on the fifth day, you commanded the seventh part where the water had been gathered together. So hold on, you're in the New Revised Standard? Yeah. Why can't I get that version to come up? That's weird. I can, yeah. Okay. Uh, Carry on, sorry. Okay. Uh, On the fifth day, you commanded the seventh part where the water had been gathered together to bring forth living creatures, birds, and fishes, and so it was done. The dumb and lifeless water produced living creatures, as it was commanded, so that therefore the nations might declare your wondrous works. Then you kept in existence two living creatures, the one you called Behemoth, and the name of the other Leviathan. And you separated one from the other, for the seventh part where the water had been gathered together could not hold them both. And you gave Behemoth one of the parts that had been dried up on the third day to live in it, where there were uh, where there are a thousand mountains. But to Leviathan you gave the seventh part, the watery part, and you have kept them to be eaten by whom you wish and when you wish. <coughs> and again, this uh, speaks to, or, or is consistent with anyway, the prophecy of Ezekiel in chapter 39. That okay, that can day, you tell me what, what in the, the New Revised, sorry to, to do this to you, but I'm trying to see where you're reading that. Can mm-hmm. you give me the verse and chapter again sure. of that? Second Esdras. Oh, Second Esdras. I thought, what are you talking about? I'm looking in Job 40 trying to find what you're <laughs> discussing. Second Esdras 6, starting at verse 47. Oh, okay, sorry. I, I don't have New Revised Standard on either Bible Hub or oh, Bible okay. Gateway. Okay. Don't know where you're reading that. Yeah. Um, there's also in Second Baruch, which again is in the Septuagint, or mm-hmm. not Septuagint, it's in the Apocrypha. Exactly. The Apocrypha. Those are not in the Septuagint. Right. Um, Necessarily. Right. Uh, Second Baruch 29.4 in the uh, Apocrypha adds the detail that it will be in the Messianic age that Leviathan and Behemoth come forth from their respective places to serve as food for the pious remnant. Um, in Ezekiel 39, this feast is uh, for, where the, the hordes of Magog are slain and the birds of the air and the beasts of the field are summoned to this um, this feast where they will feast on this flesh. Mm-hmm. But we see that same feast in, in Revelation 19. You know what I love about that? There is a, a uh, gosh, what is it called? The Spanish pillar. Um, Poro, Pozo, Pozo Moro. Pozo Moro, mm-hmm. that's it. And it shows these otherworldly fallen creatures. They're monsters. just ugly monsters that are eating what appear to be human babies. Right. And the idea that babies are sacrificed up to these monsters for food, Mm -hmm. it's a wonderful reversal of that. Exactly. In fact, even mentioned that in uh, Last Clash of the Titans. Mm -hmm. 
because that that pillar, I'd love to see that pillar someday. Well, uh, one of these a, days we have to go to Spain because yes. southern Spain's got all sorts of ruins in it. Phoenician stuff, yep. which the Phoenicians are just the descendants of the Amorites. Yep. Now, here's something else to consider that's really interesting. Some scholars compare Behemoth to the Bull of Heaven. Now, that's really, really interesting. That gets into a whole nother... From the myth of Inanna? Mm -hmm. I know, who claimed to be the bull of heaven. She she not only had the bull of heaven slain, Mm -hmm. bull of heaven was the husband of Ereshkigal, her twin sister. Right. And then she just decided, this will get her. (laughs) I'll go down to Ereshkigal and say, I'm totally here for his funeral. I feel Mm -hmm. so sick about it. (laughs) Oh, and then she kills Inanna. And then uh, um, Baal sends down, yeah, Uncle Baal sends down, is it Baal? Uh, No, no, Anu. 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 Uncle Anu think no, it's Enki. Oh, Enki, right. Yeah, yes, Enki. Enki, Enki yes. makes these demons that'll go down and they'll resurrect her. So three and a half days later, three days later, she, dawn of the third day. Yeah. Inanna is out of jail, out of a hell free. And uh, she describes herself as the bull of heaven. She's taken over. She's queen of heaven, queen of the underworld, mm-hmm. and the bull of heaven. Yeah. Which is a male. Mm-hmm. Picture, but, but she was both male and female. She was. Now, in the Canaanite mythology, Canaanite religion, the war goddess Anat, who was another aspect of Inanna, and, and the Ugaritic texts suggest that there were like three different entities that were all aspects of Inanna. Uh, Anat, the war goddess, Astarte, the sex goddess, and mm-hmm. uh, the war god Athtar, mm-hmm. all aspects of this, this entity. But Anat... Like she was a triune deity. Yeah, in her own right, sure. Yeah, in her own mind. She claimed in the Bale cycle, Anat claimed, surely I lifted up the dragon and I smote the crooked serpent, the tyrant with seven heads. I And then here, I smote Arshu, beloved of El. I put an end to Elf's calf, Atik. Atik and Arshu, the same name for the, the same entity. So in other words, Anat, Inanna, claiming that she killed Leviathan and Behemoth. Whoa, she's claiming to be all that in a bag of... Bag of chips. Transgender chips. Yeah. <laughs> so, Ooh. a bag of cow flops. So, there, there are some interesting parallels in the, the pagan religions. And to be very clear about this, we're, the, we're not saying that the Hebrews borrowed the story for the Bible no. from this. Fake news. This is the fake news version of what's actually in the Bible. Yahweh defeated Leviathan or subdued Leviathan and behemoth. Mm-hmm. And at the end of time, apparently, will bring them forth for the final judgment. Amen. How are we doing on time? Speaking uh, of time. We're, we're at about 39 minutes. Oh, great. Because so. now we can get into Leviathan. Yeah. So it's, it's cool really interesting. Stuff. Let me just very, okay, bunny trail. Just get out your little muskets, you know, one bullet weft, because there's a bunny about to hop <laughs> through your, your uh, ears. Um, there, there's a program that was on Showtime. It's not the kind of show that I would recommend for younger viewers or, or early uh, um, new believers to watch because you need to be pretty prayed up and discerning to to watch a lot of the stuff that I watch, to be honest with you. I've been a believer for a long time. Long time. Probably like 64 years. Long time. Now, there is a show called Penny Dreadful mm-hmm. that gets into this idea of, uh, I'm trying to think of what it was, uh, where, where the bunny was going. What, what was it you said right before that? Uh, behemoth and uh, Leviathan being destroyed at the end of time, God bringing them out for the final judgment and then the final destruction okay. of those okay. entities. Okay, now I remembered it. There's this show called Penny Dreadful. And it's, it's called that because in the late 19th century, there were these horror fiction, you know, magazines that were published, uh, published that were called Penny Dreadfuls, and they had short stories that were scary. Um, this show takes all of the tropes from fiction mm-hmm. and brings them into one uh, three-season arc. So you have werewolves and vampires, you have witches and all sorts of stuff. Well, there's a legend that is uh, um, explained and discovered beginning in about the second season that deals with the idea of of, of seduction from the main character. She's being seduced by two sides. Mm-hmm. And they discover as they start to translate these ravings of an old friar who was eventually burned at the stake for his, his uh, um, dealings with the devil because he was writing down the devil's story. Mm-hmm. 
was that there were there was one entity that was cleaved in two. Yes, yes. And right. one went down to the underworld, became the king of hell, so to speak, mm-hmm. and the other one stayed on earth, and he was the king of all vampires. He was the original vampire. Mm-hmm. It's similar. It, it It's the kind of thing that a Gnostic, and I wouldn't be surprised at all if there are Gnostic texts out, texts out there that take the idea that God took these two entities, or took one entity and cleaved it, and put one in the desert and one in the sea. Well, that's very much like the Enuma Elish, where Marduk defeated Tiamat and cleaved her body in two and used one half to create the heavens and the other to create the earth. Yes, yes. Again, fake news. These are fake news versions of the true design, the true creation that our Lord and Savior uh, performed for us long, long ago. And I suspect that one of these days when, when we're all, you know, okay, we're, we're, we've, our bellies are full with the marriage supper of the Lamb, and we've got the, you know, it's some time to sit and, and we worship, we'll get to ask questions, or there will be rooms where angels will say, come, let me show you this room, and we'll, you get to see history. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't that be neat oh, yeah. to see the original Let mm-hmm. There Be Light? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That would be awesome. Because mm-hmm. God doesn't need a scribe or a, you know, an iPhone to record what he does <laughs> and has done. Yeah. Well, Job chapter 41. And again, this is something scholars have uh, tried to find naturalistic explanations for. May refer to a crocodile. No, don't think so. Don't Especially think so. when you take it in context with what the other cultures around ancient Israel believed. The fake news versions. Yeah. Job 41. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Okay. In the uh, the Brenton Septuagint, it's saying serpent. And bear in mind that when you see the word serpent in the Old Testament, it is often actually discussed, and you'll see it's the same thing with worm. Mm-hmm. It's actually discussing an entity that we would consider a dragon. Yeah. So think dragon mm-hmm. as you hear this. And that is consistent with the, the stories from the other cultures around ancient Israel. Mm-hmm. Yam described, well, as we just saw, a gnat, the seven-headed twisting serpent. Yes. You know, yeah. Encircler with seven heads. Mm-hmm. Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down his tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? And the reason God is asking this is because he's, what he's saying to Job is, I can. can uh, you? Yes, exactly. Because unless you can do this with me, you really don't have standing to mm-hmm. bring this case against me. Will he make many pleas to you? Will he speak to you soft words? Will he make a covenant with you to take him for your servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you put him on a leash for your girls? Oh, I I so, so love that. This one says, Wilt thou play with him as with a bird or bind him as a sparrow for a child? I, I love that idea that, uh, okay. You're just nothing but a little pet. Yeah. Like, <laughs> this is our Lhasa Apso, Leviathan. <laughs> <laughs> this is our Dachshund Behemoth. <laughs> oh. oh. Will traders bargain over him? Will they divide him up among the merchants? Well, this says, and do the nations feed upon him? Not yet, but Ezekiel well, that's, 39. that's verse 7 yeah. in here. Mm-hmm. And the nations of the Phoenicians share him. Oh, the merchants, yes. Mm-hmm. Interesting that Canaanite became, yes, in fact, merchants in the Hebrew is Kenanim. Ah. Will they divide him up among the Canaanites? Well, suddenly, you know, it's like we don't, okay, because Canaan is the name of one of the early ancestors. Mm -hmm. I always assumed it came from that, but maybe it's more than that. It could be. Um, there. Possibly that it's just they they were as the really later Phine- the, yeah well as the later Phoenicians were they were the merchants of the world mm-hmm. par excellence yeah if you run trade you run the world yes it hasn't changed yes that is very true and especially if you control banking yeah but uh, the Phoenicians and even before them the Canaanites who were just Amorites just different names for Amorites yeah were. Uh, yeah, but isn't that interesting that the word translated merchants in the Hebrew is actually Canaanite? Huh. Hmm. Well, they divided them up among the Canaanites. Huh. And here it actually says it's Phoenicians. Phoenicians. So they're definitely right. making the connection there. Yeah. Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hands on him. Okay, hold on, because I read this to you this morning, and I think this is, this is a little more powerful. 
Verse 8 in the Septuagint, and all the ships come together would not be able to bear the mere skin of his tail. Neither shall they carry his head in fishing vessels. Hmm. He's really big. All the ships come together. Every ship yeah. lined up couldn't carry the skin of his tail. Okay, so that's verse 8 in the Septuagint, verse mm-hmm. 7 in the English. Can you fill a skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Ah, yeah. interesting. Verse 8 in the in the uh, English Standard Version. Lay your hands on him. Remember the battle. You will not do it again. Oh, well, this is verse 9 yeah, in yeah. the Septuagint. Right. But thou shalt lay thy hand upon him once, remembering the war that is waged by his mouth, and let it not be done any more. <laughs> it's like that line in the movie Johnny Dangerously. My father hung me on a hook once, Johnny. Once. <laughs> I let Leviathan bite me once. Once. <laughs> Verse 9, Behold, the hope of a man is false. He is laid low even at the sight of him. No one is so fierce that he dares to stir him up. And of course, him being Leviathan, Mm -hmm. which is interesting here that it's a male pronoun, whereas in most other, even in Enoch, first Enoch, Leviathan was considered female like Tiamat. I know. Yeah. Who then is he who can stand before me? Who has, if you can't stand before Leviathan, who I tame like a small dog or a sparrow, who can stand before me? No one is so fierce that he dares to stir him up. Who then is he who can stand before me? Who has first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. So he spoke it all into existence. Mm -hmm. Get your own dirt. I will not keep silence concerning his limbs or his mighty strength or his goodly frame. Who can strip off his outer garment? This Marduk who claims that he divided Leviathan in half, Tiamat yeah, in half. And, exactly. Yeah. Who would come near him with a bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? Around his teeth is terror. Now, now we get into some really fascinating stuff here. His back is made of rows of shields, plates, scales. Yeah. Dragon. Yeah. Shut up closely as with a seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. Okay. Verse 15 in the Septuagint. <laughs> His inwards are as brazen plates and the texture of his skin as a smearite stone. Hmm. One part cleaves fast to another and the air cannot come between them. They all remain united each to the other. They are closely joined and cannot be separated. That's 15, 16, and 17. Hmm. The, le- the Lexum English. Bottom line, dragon. Yeah. The fl- Smaug. <laughs> The flesh of its body is glued together. If one pours down upon it, it shall not be shaken. Its heart has been made firm as stone, and it has been set like an inflexible anvil. Mm. Now, wait a minute. I'm jumping ahead because, again, oh, yeah, the, the Lexham English, tra- yeah, yeah, Lexham English yeah, numbering is really different. We'll, we'll get down to this here in the English here in just a second. But, yeah, this is... <laughs> I love 18, though. Read 18. Right. Um, uh, let me, let me uh, start at 15 again. His back is made of rows of shields, shut up closely as with a seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They clasp each other and cannot be separated. His sneezings flash forth light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. Out of his mouth go... His eyes are like the appearance of the morning star. Uh, Okay. But uh, verse 19 makes it clear what... uh, 19 and 20 make clear what uh, God is saying here. Yes. Out of his mouth go flaming torches, sparks of fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils comes forth smoke as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. In the Septuagint, verse 19 says, out of his mouth proceed as it were burning lamps and and as it were hearths Mm -hmm. of fire are cast abroad. It's not just sparks. He's he's hurling flames at you. Smog. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Verse 21, his breath kindles coals, and a flame comes forth from his mouth. Dragon. Mm-hmm. Except that dragon with seven heads. Yes. This is like King Ghidorah times 2.33. Oh. Yeah, I know. Nobody knows that. <laughs> that was one of the iconic scenes in the most recent Godzilla movie, yeah. where you see this shot of Ghidorah on this, on this mountain, mm-hmm. yes. his mount of assembly yes. in the background, silhouetted in the foreground is a cross. Yes. It, watch King of the Titans. Yes. Godzilla, uh, King of Monsters. King of... 
the king of monsters, but they are called Titans. Yeah. Oh, that's right. The that's original right. and rightful rulers of Earth. Yeah. yeah there, there's a lot of messaging in that movie. And most of it's, you know, like climate change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're trying to kill us because we're killing the Earth. Um, all right. Uh, his breath kindles coals. A flame comes forth from his mouth. Verse 22. In his neck abides strength and terror dances before him. The folds of his flesh stick together, firmly cast on him and immovable. His heart is hard as a stone, hard as the lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. And the word translated mighty is Elim in Hebrew, which is a shortened form of Elohim. Mm -hmm. So the alternate reading of this, when he raises himself up, the gods are afraid. Small g gods. Small g gods. At the crashing, they are so beside this is the themselves. Fallen Elohim. Right. So interesting that. So this would say Leviathans, and you know, they're sort of like, okay, King, he's he's you know Godzilla. Yeah, yeah. That uh, or or well, Ghidorah, the one that the other monsters have to defeat because Ghidorah is basically destroying the Earth, and they don't want the Earth destroyed. They just want people to stop, you know, poisoning it. That's the subtext of Bottom the whole line Godzilla is movie. He's but, king. Well, King Ghidorah is what they call him. Right. Right. King of all the, the monsters. Um, and God subdued this before saying, let there be light. Uh, if this is chaos, if we go back to Genesis 1, verse 2. That was before God said, let there be light. See, I always say it's let there be. I always think it's let there be light. Verse 2. No, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face oh, of the okay, waters. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Verse three, it was and God said, let, let there, there be light. Be light yeah. Because of the darkness. Right. Okay. So, yeah, this is... Points to you. <laughs> you and the light. <laughs> um, so, the gods are afraid, the mighty are afraid at the crashing. They are beside themselves. But again, Yahweh saying, not me. Again, mm -hmm. I put it on a string like a sparrow. Yeah. Though the sword reaches him, it does not avail, nor the spear, the dart, or the javelin. He counts iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. What verse are you on? Because this, this one's verse, so different. Uh, that's, Is it 27? Uh, 27. Okay. The arrow cannot make him flee. For him, sling stones are turned to stubble. Clubs are counted as stubble. He laughs at the rattle of javelins. His underparts are like sharp, sharp potsherds. He spreads himself like a threshing sledge on the mire. He makes the deep boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. When he travels, the wake behind him is like white mm -hmm. froth. Right. Behind him, well, verse 32, it's, didn't need to explain it. It's right there. Verse 32, behind him, he leaves a shining wake. One would think the deep to be white haired. On earth, there is not his like a creature without fear. He sees everything that is high. He is king over all the sons of pride. Well, there you go. Now we know who the king of the sons of pride is. Mm-hmm. We're going to make it. Yep. Job 42. Then Job answered Yahweh. <laughs> Amazing that he would even dare. <laughs> uh, I'll just sit over here. <laughs> then Job answered Yahweh and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered, and he's quoting. Mm -hmm. That's in your, that, that's in quotes. If, if you're not reading along, you're just listening to this. Mm -hmm. That's in quotes. So he's quoting God. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and speak. Hear. Hear, and I will speak again. That's in quotes. Yeah. Oh, I see. Never mind. Never mind. Never mind. It's it's using a strange quote. It's mm -hmm. using a single quote inside a double quote, which right, say, right. means he's quoting somebody else. But I don't think that's what they actually mean punctuation-wise. I think it's this Job talking all the time. They're just quoting Job over and over. Yes. And Job so, may be quoting himself. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, or I, thus. I know. Yeah. It's it's poorly punctuated. Let's just put it that way. Well, word for word translation. Oh, I get. No, yeah, I'm yeah, not talking about yeah. that. I'm talking about whoever wrote the English should know if you're continuing. Okay, I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Here and I will speak. I will question you and you make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now 
My eye sees you. Now my eye sees you. Mm-hmm. Was he seeing more than a whirlwind? Don't know. Or was he using the term sees as in understands? Could, could be both. You'd think that he'd say understands. Mm-hmm. Now my eye sees you, therefore I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, what's interesting is that his repentance here is not what his friends were asking him to do. They wanted him to repent of his sins. Exactly. And Job is saying, no. I'm repenting of foolishness. I'm repenting of foolishness. I was demanding answers when I didn't understand what it was I was talking about. Exactly. I'm glad you brought that in because that, that needs to be understood. After Yahweh had spoken these words to Job, Yahweh said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My anger burns against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. <laughs> now, therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up a burnt offering for yourselves. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. For you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Ask Job to act as priest for you. Mm -hmm. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuite and Zophar the Namathite went and did what Yahweh had told them. And Yahweh accepted Job's prayer. And Yahweh restored the fortunes of Job, which he had prayed for when he had prayed for his friends. And and notice that Yahweh did not, God did not uh, rebuke Elihu, the young man who spoke up at the end. Exactly. He's not rebuked, nor did God explain why all this happened. Right. But once Job prayed for those who were afflicting him, Mm -hmm. he could have just cut him off the knees and said, I'm not praying for you. (laughs) You've been here for days yelling at me. And Yahweh restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And Yahweh gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before and ate bread with him in his house. And they showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that Yahweh had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a ring of gold. And Yahweh blessed the latter days of Job, more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand female donkeys. Hmm. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of his first daughter Jemima, and the name of the second Keziah, and the name of the third Karen Hapuk. And in all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. And after this, Job lived a hundred and forty years and saw his sons and his sons' sons four generations. And Job died an old man and full of days. It's, uh, th- th- there's so much in Job that that we we peel back. Uh, obviously, we see that God's majesty is is beyond our comprehension. And there are times like Job, we will say, "Why is this happening to me?" And it can be really difficult to understand. In fact, just yesterday, I got another email from somebody asking, "God, knowing the end from the beginning, why would He create angels that He knew would rebel? Why did He create Satan?" Why did he create Adam and Eve, knowing that they would fall and lead us into this world of pain and sorrow? Mm -hmm. Well, the alternative would be to just be all by himself. Right. Why do parents have children, knowing that there's a day coming when that child, those children, will try to get away with stuff? Oh, yeah. Will try to disobey. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you have a child, you know that that day's coming, but you do it anyway because you love them. There's so much joy from having that child. And that is what God has done in creating us, knowing that there are days coming that by creating us with free will, we're going to rebel. We're going to disobey. Mm -hmm. He could have created an entire realm of automatons that have no free will. 
then that, that means they're only loving you because you made them to so that they had to love you. Right. And there's no there's no joy in that. That's like loving no. a little robot. That's yeah. loving a little you know wind up doll. Yeah. So that that is in large part the reason that there is so much pain and suffering in this world because even the fallen realm, even in the spirit realm, the fallen were created with free will and they chose to exercise it to disobey God. But we're not seeing the whole picture. Like Job said, I I now that I see you, now that I understand that there's a realm beyond, and even we see a hint of that early on. Job had wisdom. I know that in the last days, I will see my, I know my Redeemer lives, and I yes. will see him with my own eyes yes. and not another. So that's the difficult thing for us as humans trapped in this fleshly wrapping. We, we see only what we can perceive with our natural senses, not realizing that inside us is the spirit that's going to live forever. And that's what we need to keep try to keep our sights on as best we can is eternity and if we demand that everything be right in the here and now like those who are seeking their pleasures now and taking advantage of other people so they can enrich mm-hmm. themselves and uh, uh, at the expense of others now okay you're getting your rewards now but that's all you're going to get our lives are so short they're really just a tiny split second a breath a yeah. breath compared to eternity and if you want to get satisfaction in that breath alone and spend eternity regretting it, mm-hmm. that's free will. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like the way Job put this in verse 5, verse 42, verse 5. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear. It's like I was blind, but now my eye sees you. Yes. My eyes are open. Yes. And again, it wasn't just that God made himself manifest to Job. It's it was it's deeper than that. Now I understand. Yes, because Job appeared to be, you know, in complete understanding of the Lord prior to this contest. Right. He was, you know, sacrificing for his children just in case they had sinned. Mhm. But even then had attached his physical circumstances to God's blessing. Yes. And sometimes even in our misery, God's glory is made manifest. It can be difficult. I know it's easier for us to say that when things are going well and there are people out there who are struggling and suffering. We've got friends who are dealing with physical infirmities that are are very frustrating. But there are times when he will do that to make us see or to help us to see, to put us on a path where we've got no um, artificial constructs, you know, to to lean on anymore. We, We can't Look at our physical surroundings, our our wealth, our comfort, um, and and think somehow that we're responsible for all this, or confuse the fact that we've that, that because we've got a lot, that God is pleased with us, that we're blessed. Mm-hmm. Um, as you put it, it's a test and a trap. It's when those supports are kicked out, like with Job, his physical wealth, even his children taken from him, and we we have to believe that God treated them well because they were part of this experiment that uh, Satan was trying to lure Job into, um, okay, you're, you're not only have you lost your wealth, but you're sick and your wife is, is not any help. So come on now, curse God and die. Exactly. Come on, curse God, curse God. Come on. The only God thing left to you is this him. nag. <laughs> yeah. And even then Job wouldn't do it, but he still didn't quite get it until God appeared and said, Hey, look, you don't have standing to question me. Because all of this I created. If you if you can do all these things, then then you can challenge me for what. And, and then Job said, "Okay, all right, I get it. I understand now." You That's would not, think that, that that the fallen realm, knowing these words, mm-hmm. would somehow wait a minute. I I can't do those things. <laughs> Why am I rebelling against? This yeah, guy? you know, and you wonder because I don't it, like him. That's why. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. probably how they feel. Well, again, this is not an easy path to travel, and we we know many people have dealt with this. You know, we talked with Terry James and met with him, the uh, just prophecy expert who's written many books, mm-hmm. who started down this path when his eyesight began to fail in his forties. Mm-hmm. You know, he spent the first forty years of his life as a successful, uh, uh, very very successful in in his life. I believe he was an attorney or, or businessman. I, I forget now. I should know because I've interviewed him several times. But it was after his eyesight began to fail, he could have despaired like Job. So why are you doing this to me? But instead, he turned to study of the Bible, which he has to do through the spoken word because his eyesight isn't good enough for him to read anymore. Um, 
Josh Peck, who yes. you know has been uh, physically challenged because of the the, uh, the Trevor's, the Trevor's disease, disease uh, which kind of forced him down a path of using his mind instead of being able to be physically active like most men, especially young men, would like to be. Um, so th- it's not to say that this is an easy path that uh, we're walking here in this life, but uh, as Paul writes in the New Testament, the glory that is to come will make the challenges we're facing now as nothing. And Job got it. And then God restored what he had. Some of us will make it to the end of our lives without having those physical things restored. Mm-hmm. But we just have to keep our eyes on the the bigger prize, which is eternity. Yes, that's when the true restoration, you know, d- occurs. Yeah. Restoration yeah. here is temporary. It's, again, breath. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if we're hoping in that, then we're, we're focusing on the wrong the wrong prize. And then the other aspect of Job that is so cool is getting more understanding of creation and the supernatural conflict as we see the the references to Leviathan, the primordial chaos that um, that was subdued before creation began. And uh, the hints then that uh, <laughs> there's more than one primordial chaos monster, Leviathan and Behemoth. Yes. So... Yeah, some fascinating stuff here that uh, just leads to a deeper understanding that there's more going on in the spirit realm than most of us were ever taught. And there is never a satiety point. There is always yeah. something, okay, I'm kind of full right now, but wait a minute, I'm hungry again. Well, in five years' time, when we get back around to Job, if we're still here and still working on this, I I'm sure we'll have more. We'll go, what did we know then? We were, yeah, we thought we had it down, and boy, we were clueless. Well, next week we get back to the book of Genesis and Genesis 12 as we pick up the uh, the story. And for some reason now my Bible's not wanting to, to move. Uh, we pick up the story of Abraham. Oh, good. So we uh, begin with God calling out his chosen people from among the nations, which uh, relates to what we see in Deuteronomy 32. By the way, there's more in that chapter than I thought. Well, I can't wait till we get back to Deuteronomy because 32 is, yeah. I know. Lots, lots of great stuff ahead as we see the uh, the conflict playing out in the uh, geopolitical realm. Um, remember, just a couple of weeks away is the, uh, the Remnant Warrior Conference in Dallas. Wow, that is coming up fast. Yeah, March 5th through 8th. First weekend of March. We will be at the Hilton DFW Lakes Conference Center. This will be a smaller, more intimate conference with just 300 seats because this will be in the conference center, the lecture hall, instead of in the big conference center. The lecture hall as opposed to the conference center. Um, Ellie Marzuli, Dr. Michael Lake, uh Josh Tolley, Jamie Walden, uh, Paul McGuire, mm-hmm. and then uh, you're you're going to be speaking actually on the uh, the the COVID nineteen outbreak as well. Uh, yeah, the coronavirus outbreak, yeah. uh, and I'm going to uh, I'll take questions probably too. So if you can be there, that would be awesome. But you need to get your registration in now for two reasons: one, only three hundred, mm-hmm. but also the hotel is just about out of space. Right. In fact, they may be out of space by yeah. now. And use promo code GILBERT20 if you choose to sign up. GILBERT20 because that saves you $20 per ticket when you use that promo code. And uh, Oops. Yeah. Don't uh, don't miss this one. This should be uh, should be a really, really good gathering. And then in April, remember, UK, um, we are coming to Scotland for the Scottish Bible Prophecy Conference. We're really excited about this. Oh, yeah. We love Scotland, but more than that, we want to... There, Yes, there have been other prophecy conferences in the UK. It isn't like we're the very first ones. It isn't that. But I think what we bring to the table, and we, including Jim Barfield and Stephen Wright and uh, Billy Crone, Derek mm-hmm. and myself, uh, we're bringing a viewpoint that's a little different right. from your normal prophecy conference. So if you are a fan of Gilbert House Fellowship and uh, Skywatch TV, um, of course, Billy Crone's ministry, Stephen Wright, and do you want to talk to Jim Barfield about oh, yeah. the Copper Scroll Project, um, you want to be in Troon, and seating is limited on that as well. Mm-hmm. Just a couple hundred seats there, and you'll find more information uh, at, uh, it's a long URL, but there's a link at gilberthouse.org in the right-hand column. You can go right there, but it's Scottish Bible Prophecy Conference brushfire. Dot com, but you'll find a link at gilberthouse.org. Exactly. Who's on uh, View from the Bunker tonight? Uh, tonight it is uh, Colonel David Giamona. Oh, we met him in uh, at County. the LA Congress. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Colonel Giamona is retired. He was a uh, chaplain, the U.S. Army, for 32 years. And he's got a, a um, ministry called Warrior Refuge. Uh, now, that website is being redesigned, so I'm not going to you know link to it, but he has got a forthcoming book that he's co-authoring with Troy Anderson called uh, Soldier's Guide to 
or the Army Guide to Armageddon, or Soldier's Guide to Armageddon, I think, one or the Mm -hmm. other. I think they're still debating the title with the publisher, but uh, it'll be out later this year or early next year. He's... It's interesting that he was a, in a position where he was responsible when he retired this past year for spiritual support at all 70 or 70 or 72, I forget. Interesting. <laughs> anyway, yeah, of the army installations around the world. But he's a Bible believing Christian who believes in end times prophecy. And so we talked about that and what, uh, why he is being so outspoken about his faith now. And, uh, you know, just getting his take on, on where we are in uh, the prophetic timeline. And I'll be talking with him again as uh, we get closer to uh, the publication of his book. But uh, fascinating man. And uh, like Colonel Bob McGinnis, Lieutenant Colonel Bob McGinnis, finding somebody who's spent a career in the military, who also holds a biblical view, uh, has a biblical worldview, and and believes in end times prophecy is really fascinating. So Colonel David Giamona tonight at VFTB.net. So... Father, we thank you for bringing us together over your word and uh, instructing us through the story of Job. Lord, we, we cannot conceive of your power and might and majesty. It, it is beyond our abilities to understand. Father, we, we pray for humility, not just before you, but before our brothers and sisters in this life. May they see in us the spirit of the suffering servant that you showed to the apostles when during your your time here on earth as a as a man may they see the love of Christ in us especially in this time when fear is spreading around the world like a virus and with this virus we pray for the church in china those who are helping others in their hour of need and showing the love of Christ in the midst of crisis we pray lord for the strength to do, to do the same if we find ourselves in the same circumstances We pray, Lord, for your guidance, for your blessing. We pray for those taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. And Father, we pray for wisdom and discernment to better understand your will, your word, and the humility and gentleness to share the the hope that we have in Christ with love and respect for those around us. We pray for your blessing, Father, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org.